distinguished participants of the gathering, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, I cordially welcome each and every one of you at this event dedicated to the 25th anniversary of the restoration of the Republic of Azerbaijan State Independence. I am convinced that this international conference will serve as a productive platform for the analysis of the international processes and developments in our region and also Azerbaijan's accomplishments in 25 years of its uh, independence and of course an exchange of views will be extremely valuable on those subjects and I believe there is a great need for that. Azerbaijan is a small country and we are doing our best. We have accomplished a lot and also why the world is in the state of affairs in the shape that we find it in. We need to address those reasons and root causes and I believe that the the gatherings of such distinguished experts such as yourself and diplomats alike, it is very important to have this genuine, open and transparent discussion and identifying the correct ways for the for the for the governments and for the state leaders to move forward and that would be your greatest contribution to that cause because I believe those very leaders are in dire need of advices and recommendations because the path that we have covered like a country and for us to be able to host such an event for, for, for us it is something usual something normal but we've come a long way we've covered it in a very noble fashion a glorious path indeed but i believe there's some quarters that are dissatisfied, displeased with that, and therefore I believe that at this moment in time, this event will be a great contribution. Azerbaijan is a 25-year-old sovereign country, a subject of international law. Azerbaijan has captured world's attention in the recent years owing to its accomplishments in many years. Indeed, we have been in the center of attention and there are reasons for that. In the early years of our independence, Azerbaijan was experiencing complex and tumultuous times. The return to a political scene of the national in 1993, when the people of Azerbaijan had called upon him, it really played a crucial role in saving the country's statehood. Sometimes I ask myself this question, what if at the time it wouldn't be for the for Aydar Aliyev, if he wouldn't return to power, what would the country be? I mean, in what shape and form for Azerbaijanis and for Azerbaijani politicians? This is an overarching theme. It's a main question in order to analyze comprehensively the global and regional developments and going and analyzing interstate relations. We need, we need not forget about that. And, there, and you can come up with a very substantive uh, position answering to the question that I asked. Today, it is evident how far our country has come in terms of political, social, and economic development. Under the leadership of President of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan is already suggesting its own development model to the world. In just past 12 years, our country's GDP has tripled. Poverty and unemployment has dropped dramatically and the number of new job places that we were able to open, we've reiterated that fact a number of times. We do it both here and on the international arena and anyone who takes interest in Azerbaijan is acutely aware of those facts. Although 
during the critical times, Azerbaijan's GDP accounts for 75% of one of the entire South Caucasus. World Economic Forum ranks Azerbaijan 40th in its global competitiveness report, and it makes Azerbaijan a leader country in this respect across the CIS geography. We, we are one of the leaders, but in fact, we are the leading country on, on this post-Soviet space. The likes of Fitch, Standard & Poor, and Moody issue high ratings for Azerbaijan. World Bank places Azerbaijan the upper middle income countries group, and the UN Development Program's Human Development Index classifies Azerbaijan as a high human development country. Azerbaijan is determined to transform the black gold into human capital to that end. Investments into education and advanced technologies are increasing, and important steps are taken to diversify the economy. In 2013, Azerbaijan launched its first telecommunication satellite and thus joined the Club of Space Technology Nations. Assam Service has already become known as Azerbaijan's international brand. You may say not in the United States or Europe, but the world is not just the United States. In Europe and other countries, this model is really appreciated. Today, Azerbaijan is conducting a foreign policy course that is balanced, targeting multi-vector cooperation and equal partnership backed by the country's national interests. This pragmatic course is among the factors introduced into the foreign policy concept of our independent statehood by the genius of Eydar Aliyev. As President Ilham Aliyev puts it, Azerbaijan is among the handful of countries that are members both to the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation and the Council of Europe. One of the greatest accomplishments of our foreign policy was Azerbaijan's election as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for 2012-2013 thanks to the support of 155 member states. And we all remember that it was a, a very rough standoff, so many rounds at the UN, and nonetheless we've secured 155 votes. So it's an indication that the policy conducted by the official Baku in the region and beyond is welcomed by other countries. In 2011, Azerbaijan joined the Non-Aligned Movement, the second largest organization next to the UN based on the number of the member states. Azerbaijan also successfully fulfilled the chairmanship at the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers in May, October 2014. Albeit we're a small country, but we're nonetheless a steadfast partner in ensuring international peace and security, and we are active member of the International Anti-Terrorism Coalition. Azerbaijan was among the first countries to respond to the calls of confronting the anti-terrorism challenges. Our military servicemen are proudly serving under the NATO command in Afghanistan and Iraq. Today, Azerbaijan continues to play a key role in NATO cargo shipments to and forth from Afghanistan. We're also, Azerbaijan is an initiator of several regional scale trilateral cooperation formats. Several developing trilateral formats such as Azerbaijan, Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Turkmenistan, and Azerbaijan, Russia, Iran are valuable initiatives for addressing regional matters and developing cooperation ties.
engagement with the Muslim countries that we share common history, culture, faith and joint interests with has always been excellent. At the most recent summit of the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, the member states have unequivocally supported Azerbaijan and firmly condemned Armenia's aggression through an appropriate resolution. That summit also saw establishment of a contact group within the OIC dedicated to the Armenia-Azerbaijan Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I want to reiterate that aspect. In general, today in the world, in international relations, the respect towards international law is extremely important. I will return to the subject, but it's very unfortunate that my own observations demonstrate that in the past 25 years, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and, and the Warsaw Pact, the international law has been relegated by the leading nations of the world. Whenever they need it, they produce it, they refer to it, but other than that, it's always forgotten, and for us, an extremely perilous and treacherous trend. Azerbaijan has continuously expanded its cooperation with the European countries as well. Very good relations on the bilateral level contribute to development of Azerbaijan-EU cooperation. Azerbaijan forges these ties on solid foundation of equal partnership underpinned by shared interests and conducts an appropriate policy to that end. Today, Azerbaijan has either signed or adopted documents regarding strategic partnership with eight EU member states. And the ninth is Serbia, and it demonstrates that there are one third of total number of, of the EU member states. The mutually beneficial relations of cooperation with the countries of the Far East, Africa, and Latin America are also rising exponentially. Opening of new embassies in those parts of the world is a telling example of significance attached to bolstering of ties that are based on mutual benefit with the regional countries, both in bilateral and multilateral formats. Energy factor and its proper use for socio-economic development of the country has been very important, but it has been an integral part of, of our uh, foreign policy agenda as well. Signing of the contract of the century, uh, with that contract, by the way, Azerbaijan has opened the Caspian Sea for joint exploration by foreign companies and, and managed to uh, attract multi-billion dollar investments into petroleum production. And as a result, a transportation infrastructure was introduced called for connecting the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. And thanks to our resolute support and stance, the Bakut-Bilisi-Jehan oil pipeline was commissioned in 2006 and was a landmark project that not only delivered Azerbaijan's oil to the international markets, but also opened a new corridor. It was implementation of this historic project. Commissioning of the bakut bilisi Erzurum gas pipeline in 2007 was a milestone for the region. Delivery of gas from the Shah Deniz field to Turkey through that pipeline was the launching point for gaining access to the European market. I wish to particularly outline that the expect, with the expected investment of $45 billion, Shah Deniz II, Tanap, and Tap are among the world's largest and most enormous energy projects. And with their commissioning, we're changing the Europe's energy map, and Azerbaijan is playing a role of a locomotive or a driving force in this project. The reason that I'm mentioning this, the issue of energy is extremely 
important and it really impacts foreign policy and interstate relations. Azerbaijan combines and carefully preserves the legacy of multiple civilizations and cultures and we are preserving them very carefully with great deal of love and affinity. Azerbaijan was the first country in the Eastern world to grant women a right to vote. And in fact, we were ahead of most Western nations in ensuring that fundamental right. Being a Muslim country, we were the ones who who authored the first opera and ballet. So we're really and rightfully proud of the fact. Baku regularly hosts wide range of high-level international events, summits, and conferences that are dedicated to discussion of the pressing problems of modernity and matters related to cooperation. Such events include the International Intercultural Dialogue Forum, Global Open Societies Forum, World Summit of Religious Leaders, World Youth Forum, World Economic Forum, Eurovision Song Contest, and others. Other examples w could include Third World Intercultural Dialogue Forum, Baku Humanitarian Forum, uh, UN Alliance of Civilizations Global Forum, and others. In this context, I wish to highlight the inaugural European Games held in Azerbaijan in the summer of 2015. This was an extremely important event both for ourselves and for the world. It was not just a sporting event. It was an event that contributed to peace, security, and mutual understanding. And we all know how important tool sport could be, sporting could be. But unfortunately, geopolitical interests prevailed to that extent that they use sport sports and sporting area sometimes is left helpless in the face of such dangerous trends. And I believe that first, for, for first European games to be, hold, to be held in the Muslim countries of Azerbaijan was an appreciation of the role that our country plays in forging cooperation between the civilizations and cultures. And it's a greatest appraisal. Next year, Azerbaijan will host fourth Islamic Solidarity Games. This in turn will contribute to bolstering of peace, solidarity, and tolerance around the world and demonstrates Azerbaijan's commitment to the philosophy of sports. You all know that it, all of those events are really difficult and challenging events from different aspects, but my point is that no matter how small of a country we are, we are contributing immensely to reducing tensions. The resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict nonetheless is the greatest challenge facing Azerbaijan. For Azerbaijan, uh, the restoration of its territorial integrity is the issue of top priority when it comes to the country's international engagement and agenda. The Armenia-Azerbaijan Nagorno-Karabakh problem is the greatest impediment both to Azerbaijan's development and the economic growth of the entire region. The UN Charter, UN Security Council resolutions, Helsinki Final Act, UN General, General Assembly Resolution passed on, on 2008, and then multiple decisions and resolutions adopted by the Non-Aligned Movement, OAC, Council of Europe, NATO, European Parliament, OIC, and others, they constitute solid legal groundwork for resolving the conflict. And they are norms of the international law. All of those documents supporting Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and inviolability of our borders. The international community and international organizations recognize the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan and fair resolution of the conflict based on the norms of international law must be a top priority issue for them. 
Regrettably, in the last several decades, we only hear about the international law. For at least as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, an attitude towards the international law is the logical explanation of the present tensions around the world and us, Azerbaijan, being on the brink of the war. But this cannot last forever. Perhaps if it weren't for the Nagorno Karabakh conflict, we would have never believed to the existence to the of injustice and double standards. I mean, we could have realized it, but not to the, such a great extent. But there's nothing we can do. This conflict is part of our daily lives, and and it teaches us a great political lesson. And it's not just us learning from that. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Foreign policy chief of the world's superpower nation sends out a message to the world that the leaders are not ready for the resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Strange, isn't it? As far as the conflict resolution is concerned, can you name a single logical proposition made on the part of the Minsk Group co-chairs, the ones that assumed mediation responsibility that was rejected by Azerbaijan? If in the most complex circumstances, Azerbaijan has displayed constructive attitude and declared its readiness to continue with the negotiations for the name of peace, let us for a minute imagine that Nagorno-Karabakh is a disputed territory. Of course, this is extremely hypothetical, given that Nagorno-Karabakh is one of the ancient and historical lands of Azerbaijan. But never let's for a second think about it. What about other seven provinces? Armenia has never forwarded any claims regarding those areas. For the past 25 years, Azerbaijan has been trying to ensure withdrawal of the Armenian armed forces from the occupied territories and return of the inter internally displaced population. You know that 750 to 760,000 Azerbaijanis were expelled from there. They're, they're deprived of their hospitals, of their cemeteries, of their loved ones, of their schools and kindergartens. So my question is, when we talk about human rights, principles of justice, and those superpowers and those important organizations, whenever they profess those notions, maybe they should look into the mirror sometimes. So what were we supposed to be ready for in these past 25 years? What have the co-chairs done to secure the unconditional return of those seven provinces? They even struggle sometimes to produce a simple statement regarding the respect of the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. You know, there are a number of there are a number of issues when within international organizations the issue of territorial integrity always becomes an obstacle and impediment in our cooperation. So we're always being frank with this. How come for 10 years you're saying that you're supporting Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and now you're drifting away trying to omit uh, such expressions from the texts of the documents? On the other hand, I don't know how, how, how long it took the co-chairs, but they come up with the easiest solution they managed uh, to come up is the following. You come to agreement and we will endorse this. I don't know which, which uh, classic uh, diplomat came up with such a theory, but that for us in this process, with one of them being Azerbaijan, it's the, it's the uh, demonstration of attitude, such a great injustice, and and with such a great degree of double standards with respect to Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. This is a vivid and telling example. So another fascinating fact, America's top diplomats remark about leaders not being ready bears a striking similarity with the rhetoric often used by Armenia about Azerbaijan not being ready for compromises. So this is a thesis frequently used by Armenia, and they coincide. 
Azerbaijan is not ready for compromises, or this is it really they, they really bear resemblance with which is other. By Armenian standards, the extent of Azerbaijan's readiness to peace is measured by the willingness to completely surrender the Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. Perhaps that is exactly what the last statement coming from the United States implies. I believe whenever I believe there's an explanation, our American colleagues owe us an explanation with respect to that statement. You know, we are going to see the change of administration in the United States very soon, but the one of the re final messages, it's, we, we, we heard that some 10,000 people heard about that, but when such a message comes from a foreign policy chief of that country is heard by hundreds of millions of people. So the audience of such remarks is greater than the one we have here. So that's extremely important to take into account. In his view, that one cannot see what's needed for the resolution right now and reference to the conflict as frozen and it really runs in line with the interests of the Armenians. This attitude is, is exactly what emboldens Armenians and enables them to protract the conflict resolution for as long as possible. And they really create a groundwork or a foundation for that. I really wonder what the motive behind such remark was. Was it a deliberate message or he simply misspoke? The narrative of the conflict is incomplete, however, without me mentioning the Hojali genocide. Because in certain circles, for certain countries, genocide is considered to be the gravest crime and event. Armenians have built their genocide narrative on complete false facts, and they pursue this as something, one of the greatest genocides of the 20th century. But in the at the end of the 20th century, the final genocide of the late 1990s was committed by Armenians in the town of Hojale. The parliaments of Mexico, Pakistan, Colombia, Czech Republic, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Peru, Romania, Panama, Jordan, Sudan, Honduras, and Guatemala have recognized this crime as genocide. Legislative bodies of such U.S. states as West Virginia, California, Massachusetts, Texas, New Jersey, Maine, New Mexico, Arkansas, Georgia, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Florida, Mississippi and other states passed appropriate resolutions. The governors of Hawaii and Monta Montana issued special proclamations regarding the recognition of the Hojali massacre. The purpose of the Justice for Hojali campaign launched in more than 40 countries around the world and initiated by the Vice President of the Hyderabad Foundation Ms. Leila Aliyeva is to provide the international community with the extensive information about that bloody event. This year, on October the 18th, the Republic of Azerbaijan will celebrate the 25th anniversary of restoration of its independence. During that time, Azerbaijan has established diplomatic relations with 177 countries and opened 91 diplomatic missions in foreign countries and international organizations. In the meantime, 53 embassies, four general consulates, 12 honorary consulates, and offices of 16 international organizations operate in Azerbaijan. As it has already been mentioned, despite being located in a complicated geopolitical region and having it covered the tumultuous development path, thanks to its development and independent and balanced foreign policy course, Azerbaijan has evolved into an initiator of regional scale projects and a steadfast partner to others. Diplomatic Corps and respective heads of diplomatic missions played an important role in making this a success story. And I also 
mean the members of the diplomatic corps accredited uh, to Azerbaijan, and I appreciate their efforts for taking our relations further to the next level. In the sense, we thought that it would be fascinating to learn the perspectives of the diplomats accredited to Azerbaijan on the relations with those friendly nations throughout that period. And as it has already been mentioned by a previous speaker, although we're covering 25 years, but for us it, it's, it is of extreme importance and significance. Embassies and, and diplomats and cooperation between uh, Azerbaijan and their home countries is of very important. Some of them are written in, in were authored in English. Some of them were uh, translated into Azerbaijani. And we have compiled them and, and had them released. And we're going to present them to you. And we, we titled them Azerbaijan's 25 years of independent Azerbaijan through the eyes of ambassadors. We don't see it quite very often in international practice. We're a Muslim country with our own individual attitude, and so it's very important for us. So this compilation, like I said, features articles by the heads of missions, uh, some 49 ambassadors and permanent representatives uh, were featured there. But there's Although there were several ambas ambassadors who were striving for bolstering economic ties for Azerbaijan, but nonetheless, they failed to submit a certain article. Well, that's part of uh, part of our democracy, but we will take that into account. But of course, it was a as a small initiative, but although but it could be a small contribution to our independence history. I am going to conclude my speech uh, here. Uh, should there be any questions, I'll be ready to take them at a later stage, ready for Q&A session if needed. But uh, thank you for your attention and patience. And I wish success to the work of this event.